Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to CSIS and to the Transnational Threats Project. My name is Tom Sanderson. I direct the Transnational Threats Project here at CSIS, and I'm joined by my team, which includes Caleb Johnson, Jessica DiPaolo, Debbie Stroman, Maria Galperin, and Nikita Mann. Thank you for all the help you did and offered in making this possible. Let me first point out the emergency exits. There is the main set of staircase that goes down to the first floor. Behind the elevators to the right is another emergency exit and a staircase, and then behind us is another set of stairs as well. So just look for me, for Caleb Johnson over here, and for my other team members here um, if there is an emergency. <clears throat> the TNT project has been in existence for almost 25 years and has completed field work in some 70 countries. It's this widespread field work that we believe delivers to our audiences, both in government and outside of government, some of the most important information and it goes to policymakers, it goes to the intelligence community, to war fighters, to Congress, the White House, the private sector, the media, and most importantly to the general public, which is why we hold events like this. We are nearing the end of two pr projects. One is on foreign fighters and one is on militancy across the African Sahel region. And stay tuned for the fall. We're hopefully launching two new exciting projects, one in North Africa, focusing on Libya, and then one on Russia and on Central Asia. Very happy to welcome to CSI's two remarkable gentlemen. General Frank Taylor to my left is a good friend of the TNT program and of CSI's more broadly in his past work on a number of working groups and advisory committees. General Taylor currently serves as Undersecretary of Intelligence and Analysis at the Department of Homeland Security. In this capacity, General Taylor provides the Secretary, DHS senior leadership, DHS <coughs> components, and state, local, tribal, and private sector partners with the homeland security intelligence and information that they need to keep the country safe, secure, and resilient. INA is a member of and the department's liaison to the U.S. national intelligence community. Prior to becoming undersecretary, General Taylor served as vice president and chief security officer at the General Electric Company and held additional senior government positions, including assistant secretary of state for diplomatic security and served as ambassador at large and coordinator for counterterrorism. Ambassador Taylor also served a distinguished 31-year career in the U.S. Air Force. Frank, it's great to have you back here at CSIS. Thanks, yeah. Joining us today from the Netherlands on my right is that nation's national coordinator for counterterrorism, Mr. Dick Skolf. Mr. Skolf has been in a number of very important positions for his nation, serving as Director General for Public Safety and Security at the Ministry of Interior, Deputy Secretary General of the Ministry of Justice, Director General for Police at the Ministry of Security and Justice, and now in his current position as the National Counterterrorism Coordinator, a position where Mr. Scoff is responsible for cybersecurity, counterterrorism, and crisis management. The United States and the Netherlands have a long history of cooperation in security fields, from coalition partnerships against Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and the Taliban, to many other areas of cooperation. We're grateful for having your troops, your analysts, your police officers, your case officers, and others standing alongside us as we confront these threats. So I'm sure we do not say it enough, but thank you very much for, for always being there with us. Today's discussion will focus on information and intelligence sharing across the European Union, but also between partners like the Netherlands and the United States. We've all watched in horror as a series of terror attacks hit Europe over the past 18 to 20 months, beginning with Charlie Hebdo in Paris in January 2015, we saw attacks then hit Brussels and Paris, Nice, Bavaria, Istanbul, and many other places. These terrorists have killed and injured hundreds of people across Europe. What emerged from the post-attack investigations was the revelation and the realization that information on the perpetrators was not adequately shared both within nations and among them. A combination of factors account for this, bureaucratic tangles and rivalries, failure to harmonize technology across borders, national laws regarding privacy and differences between them, ins insufficient human and financial resources, counterterrorism fatigue, and just the sheer difficulty of trying to prevent attacks from clandestine organizations that use highly encrypted devices, have skills, hide in plain sight at times, hide within communities. This is very, very difficult to challenge that. In an effort to improve this and to remove those impediments, the Dutch government, while holding the presidency of the European Union, took the initiative to develop a roadmap for improving information sharing. I will now turn to Mr. Scove so that he might detail what he and his team have come up with in this respect. Following about 15 minutes of comments, General Taylor will remark on 
the range of threats we're facing today and also talk about the great relationship we have with the Netherlands and some other issues that the general would like to bring up. Then we'll open it up to all of you. For those of you joining online or watching us on C-SPAN, you can send a question to the CSIS Transnational Threats Project Twitter account using under CSIS underscore threats. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Scoff. Thank you again for joining us and for your hard work on initiating this roadmap. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it, it's of course an honor for me to uh, have been invited to uh, uh, CSIS to stand here in front of you and talk about the enormous challenge of information exchange, a crucial element in the prevention and fight against terrorism. Uh, but first of all, let me also say that I'm, I'm very happy to sit here with General Taylor because we, we already are working very closely together as the United States and the Netherlands are, so it's, it's, it's terrific that you brought us together today. Um, with all the recent developments in Europe the last few years, I can imagine that you are interested in hearing more about uh, what the threat in Europe looks like, and even more importantly, what we are doing to counter it, especially with regard to information sharing. And I will try to give you an idea of what we do, starting with my own country, of course, the Netherlands. Uh, the terrorist threat in the Netherlands uh, is currently assessed as substantial. This means that the chance of an attack in the Netherlands is real, but there are no specific indications that an actual attack is being prepared. At present, the threat to the Netherlands is still primarily jihadist in nature. There are no specific indications that terrorist networks are preparing attacks in our country, despite the fact that since the end of 2015, investigation of cross-border jihad networks and attack cells have revealed an increasing number of links to the Netherlands. Since early 2016, the number of just jihadists traveling to uh, conflict zones abroad was slowly declining, of course, specifically to Syria and Iraq. About 260 Dutch foreign terrorist fighters have traveled to Syria and Iraq so far, of which approximately 180 are currently still present in that region. In reaction to this threat, we recently developed a new counterterrorism strategy for the period 2016 until 2020. Key elements are a threat-based approach, which means that priorities are set on the basis of current threat situation. A comprehensive approach, which means that we take both preventive and repressive measures and follow up on cases using interdisciplinary methods. The comprehensive approach is applied both on national and local level. On the local level, this takes the form of multidisciplinary case consultations and community engagement. A combination of network and individual approach, which means that we identify networks and attempt to undermine them, and that we apply a person-specific approach. Particular attention is given to the potential lone actors, individuals with a third and grievance towards society and the potential for violence. And of course, we all do this in respect to the rule of law. Then on to Europe. ISIS has been <coughs> systematically directing, coordinating, and preparing attacks in Europe since late 2013. The recent attacks in Brussels and Paris uh, made this painfully clear. These are most likely still various, uh, there are most likely still various ISIS cells present in Europe who may attempt to carry out attacks in the near future. The threat of large scale attacks in Europe by an Al Qaeda also continue to exist. Furthermore, lone actors continue to pose a threat, both inspired by terrorist propaganda as well as actively, actively coached by jihadists <coughs> from Syria or Iraq. And examples are the recent attacks in France, Belgium, and Germany. The current efforts by the anti-ISIS coalition lead to a significant, significant decrease of ISIS territory and people traveling from Europe to Syria. This means we have uh, an increased attention for people returning from Syria back to the Netherlands and also back to Europe. Every returnee in the Netherlands is questioned upon returning to the Netherlands and is subject to a tailor-made approach. When there is a suspicion of terrorist activities, he or she will be put in custody. And of course, our intelligence service monitors every returnee closely. The last concern I would like to mention here is the influx of the so-called ISIS operatives, using the refugee uh, routes to get into Europe, which we witnessed last winter and spring. We know now that there are a number of ISIS operat operative cells and operatives active in Europe that took advantage of this refugee crisis to travel from Syria to Europe and back, sometimes for a short while. Now that the EU borders are monitored more closely and the influx of refugees, at least up to the Netherlands, has somewhat diminished, the challenge to enter Europe seems to have increased. Of course, it still requires our full attention and monitoring capacities. 
The nature of the threat makes it crucial to improve international information exchange. Recent terrorist attacks underline that terrorists do not respect national borders. An attack may be preceded by preparatory acts and travel movements with a great number of countries. Therefore, it is crucial that all relevant information in the field of counterterrorism is shared between authorities of different countries. We must take all necessary steps to ensure that the right people have the right information at the right time so that they can uh, intervene by checking people and cargo on the border, by investigating actual threats or by monitoring and eventually arresting someone and prosecuting him or her. We, we have seen positive developments in Europe over the last two years in this regard. The amount of law enforcement information that is shared through systems such as the Schengen Information System and through organizations such as Europol is increasing significantly. The European Police Organization Europol has set up the European Counter-Terrorist Center, Center as a platform for information exchange and cross-checks with the law enforcement community regarding terrorism. Also, new instruments have been and continuing to be developed. An important development is the use of passenger data, PNR, to counter terrorism and serious crime. With the new EU directive, all EU member states are obliged to establish passenger information units, PIUs, for the analysis of these data. The Netherlands, in cooperation with other member states and third countries, including the United States, are exploring technology that allows member states to match information on terrorists and criminals with travel information in a real time and in an anonymous way without breaching privacy or revealing modus operandi. An informal EU workgroup led by the Netherlands has been established to ensure compatible national implementations of the PNR directive in the member states. In the field of uh, the security services, big steps have been taken in European, uh, European cooperation with the counter-terrorism group. An informal working group structure of the security services, intelligence services in the EU member states, as well as Norway and Switzerland. Over the last few months, a platform and database have become operational through which participating security services share information on suspected foreign terrorist fighters and can cross-check with each other in real time. You understand I cannot go into detail in here, but uh, suffice to say that this cooperation is yielding operational results, and I really mean that. Still, we feel more needs to be done. This is why the improvement of international cooperation was one of the priorities during the Dutch EU presidency in the past six months. We have taken the amb ambitious initiative to set up a roadmap to enhance information exchange in the field of law enforcement, counterterrorism, and border immigration. This roadmap includes necessary actions to improve information management and the cross-border exchange of information, including the interoperability of systems. The purpose is to support operational investigations, specifically in counterterrorism, real, real, realizing there is a close connection between terrorism and crime, and to swiftly provide frontline practitioners, such as police officers, border guards, public prosecutors, immigration, and custom officers, with comprehensive, uh, topical, and high quality information. A single search interface. <coughs> fosters the effectiveness of operational investigations. Basic tenet of this roadmap is that all relevant information should be shared unless there are strong operational or legal reasons not to do so. Access in the roadmap include a uniform application of criteria and markers for persons linked to terrorist activity, a uniform messaging format that will ensure interoperability access to and used by Europol of key systems, such as the Schengen Information System, the Visa Information System, and Eurodac, the fingerprints. Um, so each, but because each asylum fingerprint database is there. And consistently, security checks of people registering at immigration hotspots increase in Italy. The implementation of the actions is an ongoing process, but most changes are foreseen for this year and next year. With the adoption of this roadmap, uh, Europe has shown strong political commitment to feed and use information systems to the maximum extent as a conditio sine qua non for achieving an effective sharing of information, which will enhance trust between operational actors. With that, it shows strong political commitment to the exchange of relevant information and cooperation in the fight against terrorism. 
without sacrificing core values, fundamental rights, and norms within the European Union, just as privacy and data protection. Ladies and gentlemen, the roadmap will enable us better to prevent the unnoticed crossing, or crossing of borders by suspected of known ter or known terrorist fighters and avert terrorist attacks. Within the EU, but also in other continents, such as the United States. The importance of information exchange at an international level is clear. It is in our common security interest to keep improving our cooperation in this, in this respect. Only together we will be able to fight this threat effectively, effectively and keep our society as safe as possible. Thank you for your attention. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Scope. General Taylor, over to you. Oh, it's a pleasure <coughs> to be once again at CSIS, uh, certainly, and to see my uh, good friend Tom Sanderson, but uh, as importantly to be on the same stage with uh, my close colleague, uh, Dick Scope, uh, in this fight uh, that uh, we have uh, against terrorism. Uh, the Netherlands uh, is one of DHS's closest partners in Europe and internationally. And a number of the programs uh, that DHS has implemented internationally originated as pilot programs with our colleagues in the Netherlands. Uh, the U.S. and the Netherlands have faced uh, the issue of foreign terrorist fighters for a long time. And I've been to the Netherlands several, several times to see their impressive work firsthand. Most recently, Deputy Secretary Mayorkas and I were in Amsterdam for the U.S.-EU JHA Ministerial. The ministerial focused on improving cooperation on a broad range of justice and security issues, including migration, CT, money laundering, data protection, criminal law, cooperation, child sexual exploitation, and organized crime. Our CT discussions during the JHA ministerial emphasized the need for improved information exchange. Uh, particularly the Dutch roadmap for the information sharing among uh, European services. We are now working uh, with the current uh, EU presidency in Slovakia on implementation of this very, very important initiative. Nearly 15 years after the 9-11 attacks, it is still a dangerous world. San Bernardino, Orlando, Egypt, Nice, Brussels, Paris, and other attacks are terrible reminders of the threat we face. We have moved from a world of terrorist-directed attacks to a world that includes the threat of terrorist-inspired attacks, attacks by those who are living among us, who self-radicalize and are inspired by terrorist propaganda on the Internet. By the nature of the terrorist-inspired attacks, by, by their nature, terrorist-inspired attacks are often difficult to detect by intelligence and law enforcement communities. They could occur with little or no notice and in general make for a more complex homeland security challenge. This threat environment has required a whole new type of response that goes beyond traditional CT and law enforcement approaches to address the threat from homegrown violent extremists. We are enhancing our comprehensive efforts aimed at addressing the root causes to prevent the next generation of recruits. I'd like to just close with uh, a view from Homeland Security, the, the threat uh, vectors that we believe we face. Uh, first, in aviation security, that Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and ISIL continue to see uh, an attack on aviation as an important part of their strategy. This year we have seen uh, three airliners attacked uh, in the Sinai and twice in Somalia and have clear indications that our enemies are trying to perfect ways of introducing explosives and other devices onto aircraft for the purposes of uh, destroying them in mid-flight. So aviation security uh, both in the United States and across the globe remain a high priority. Second, border security. As we look at the vast borders of our country, we want to expand those borders into uh, across the world. Uh, as the Secretary mentions, to play offense uh, or defense 
on the one yard line of the enemy as opposed to playing defense on our one yard line and strengthening border security. Critical to that is the information exchange between our partners across the globe to better understand who these individuals are that are transi transiting uh, our borders uh, for nefarious purposes. The fourth threat is, uh, third threat is cybersecurity and the protection of our cyber domains. Uh, DHS has been designated as the uh, point of contact for the uh, protection of the .gov and pro probably more importantly for the sharing of threat information with the private sector. That's not our topic <coughs> today, but it is an area of increased concern with all of the reports of hacking and uh, things that are going on uh, across the world. And finally, uh, preventing homegrown violent extremists. Uh, <coughs> as I mentioned, we are in a new environment today of um, where the enemy is, isn't necessarily sending operatives, but they're getting on social media and recruiting folks that are U.S. citizens or citizens of our colleagues across the world to commit terrorist acts uh, within their homeland. They don't have to travel to Syria or Iraq. Uh, they can, in the comfort of their home, uh, read the propaganda and, and radicalize themselves. We believe that a big part of our mission in homeland security is outreach to uh, the Ameri American Muslim community, who, by the way, are the targets of this propaganda within our own country, to help those communities build strategies uh, to defend against this, uh, this propaganda, this social media propaganda that are causing uh, young men and women to uh, take up the ISIL banner. So Tom, with that, I'll, I'll right. stop and look forward to questions from our audience. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Frank and Dick, both of you. <clears throat> Let me open it up now. We do have one question that's come in on the uh, Twitter account, and I think I have it here. On email or on uh, text? Okay, great. Isn't, tech, isn't technology wonderful? <laughs> it is. Okay, this comes from Matt Levitt, who you all know quite well at the Washington Institute. is one of the top counterterrorism terrorism specialists in the U.S. and one of the top uh, Hezbollah experts. And Matt's question is, just prior to the Brussels bombing, the EU CT coordinator issued a report saying that several member states still had no electronic connection to Interpol on all their border crossings. He concluded that information sharing still does not reflect the threat. For example, European databases record only 2,700 verified foreign terrorist fighters despite, quote, well-founded estimates that around 5,000 EU citizens have traveled to Syria and Iraq to join ISIS and other extremist groups. Worse still, over 90% of the reports of verified foreign terrorist fighters came from just five member states. Uh, in Iraq to join ISIL and other extremist groups. Have we made tangible progress since then? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> now, let, let, me, let me elaborate and a little bit. Thank you, Matt, it. for that great question. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, um, because I think the European Counterterrorism Coordinator was quite right in, in, in mentioning uh, what he said, because we, uh, what he said was true. Uh, but we, um, within the GSA Council, which is the, the, the meeting of the ministers uh, from the different member states of the European Union, we had this uh, informal report by the European Counterterrorism Coordinator, so it was noticed there as well. Uh, it was statistics, and, and we had it all uh, on paper um, in general and for each country itself. Um, and we have seen a tremendous progress in these statistics. Um, after it, it started actually after the Paris attacks. Um, and a lot of information is being shared. The Interpol databases now in most countries is connected. Uh, the, uh, the Schengen information system is much better feeded, and not only by the five countries that, that were mentioned, but everybody is <coughs> really entering uh, their information in these databases. So it was made a lot of progress. So that's, that's a little bit more than just a guess. Okay, excellent. I, I would uh, certainly uh, agree that we've made great progress. I think uh, the, the work within Europol uh, has been spectacular, uh, both within Europe and the cooperation uh, between law enforcement and the sharing of uh, relevant CT information, but also um, bilateral, uh, multilaterally within the EU and with the U.S. Uh, has been strengthened. 
we've strengthened our uh, HSPD-6 agreements. Uh, Dick was just here to sign the Dutch agreement with the, the Terrorist Screening Center to strengthen the exchange of that information. Um, and I'm pleased that the, uh, the intelligence services uh, in Europe have come together in, in sharing more information uh, among themselves. But you're never satisfied. Mm -hmm. This is a business where um, um, you can't rest on your laurels. Uh, we live in a very dynamic information environment, and one piece of information not shared could be the basis of a, a very successful terrorist attack. So while we have made progress, there's still a ton of work to do um, to improve that uh, sharing both between the EU and, our, uh, and the U.S., but also within the EU and the EU partners. Great. Um, my colleague, former colleague Zach, is in the room here. And, and Zach and I went to the Syria-Turkey border. You, you're aware of this, Frank, and others, to interview a trafficker at the border uh, at Entrepreneur in Baba Salam. And he dealt in all sorts of things that he moved over the border, people, weapons, et cetera. But one of his specialties was passports. And he would buy passports from Europeans coming in who were joining the Islamic State, no longer believed that they were citizens of the European country from which they came. And then he would resell them. He would repurpose them. He, would, he had access to everything. It was really remarkable. And we interviewed him on two occasions. And of course, that presents a tremendous problem given the visa waiver program. Can you give us an update on where things are with the visa waiver program, efforts to strengthen it, understanding that we need to have this incredibly important program to bring business men and women over and back and forth across Europe and to the United States, but at the same time, individuals, thousands of which have come from Europe on European passports to fight and can return and then travel to the United States? That's for me or for Dick? For me. I'll start with you, Frank. Okay. Um, well, Let's start with the fact that the visa waiver program is not a waiver of mm -hmm. visa program. It is a security program that uh, <clears throat> uh, individuals have to apply for and have to provide certain data uh, that is uh, screened against our, uh, our holdings with regard to the potential threats that they uh, present. Uh, and one of the most important parts of that is their identity and who they actually are uh, is a part of that validation that occurs. So while there's concern, certainly, for anyone coming out of Syria with a fake passport, we, we believe that the, the strength of the visa waiver program and the ESTA that we use <coughs> to uh, vet uh, those individuals is very strong and getting even more robust. The Secretary has directed two uh, security changes in, in involving additional data uh, data elements that are required under the um, uh, ESTA program or the Visa Waiver program for folks to apply. So uh, I think uh, it is a threat that we are most concerned with. Uh, our colleagues in ICE uh, in the Immigration and Customs Enforcement area are working very closely with our European partners and others on fake uh, documentation and passports. Uh, and we're getting better and better at understanding what that risk is and how that risk is, may, may manifest itself within the uh, visa waiver program going forward. Okay. Any comments there, Dick? Well, not, not directly in relation to the visa <coughs> waiver program, but uh, it's very important every member state, and I'm, I'm quite sure that, that we do at least, is that every known traveler uh, uh, is being signaled on his passport is being put in the Schengen information system, is being put into the stolen lost documents of Interpol, so that we at least know that we have to look out for these documents. Um, and and if, if they're used by others, I mean, we have seen it, at least we know, so that, and, and that's very important. And, and I think in that respect, we have come also from a long way. Um, okay. and, and 2016 certainly looks different than 2014. Okay. Great. Let's open it up to the audience here. Uh, yeah, Dr. Harlan Oman, wait, please wait for the microphone since we have uh, folks listening uh, online. Up front, Nikki. Yep, Dr. Harlan Oman here. Uh, thanks, and thanks to the panel. My question really applies to all three, and Tom, if you want to answer this. Um, in the watches of the night, I seem to think sometimes that we maybe exaggerate the danger of terrorism. If you go back 100 
40 years ago, historically, the danger was certainly as great or much greater. Kings, queens, czars, presidents were being routinely assassinated. Alfred Nobel was probably the greatest contributor to terrorism by inventing dynamite. Um, 1919, 1920, you may not be aware, but there were 24 letter bombs that were mailed throughout the country that induced a huge panic. Tens of thousands were summarily arrested, deported, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do we learn anything from that time? Because maybe it was more than just World War I and the Depression, but that bout of terrorism that went on for 30 or 40 or 50 years seemed to dissipate. Is there anything to be learned from that particular history? Because as I said, if you go back and read the newspapers and the press at the time, terrorism was probably seen as a much greater danger then than it was today. So what do we have to learn? Is it possible that terrorism may be rather like the hula hoop, a passing fad, and as it seemed to disappear in the 20s and 30s, could we see that happen again? I'll offer some comments to start, and thank you, Harlan, for that. Um, certainly things do have their phases, they come and go. I think the concern now, of course, is that terrorists have social media, they have potential access to WMD, particular bio materials. Um, and Sure, I'm sure they did have access to biomaterials, but the social media multiplier is just unbelievable. ISIS puts out 90,000 messages a day and images, or at least they did at the height of their activity. Um, certainly we can learn from looking back and say, look, the sky is not falling. We can have these terrorism incidents and we need to have resilience, a major part of what Department of Homeland Security uh, focuses on. And so we do need to remember and we need, do need to look to other countries that have dealt with this, Israel, for example, the UK for many, many years and understand that there is a way forward without trampling on privacy, without um, causing divides within cultures, within communities. Um, but I think what we have today is quite serious. And I know everyone typically says it's never been as bad uh, as it is today, but the reality is technology is such a force multiplier for these folks. And I do think we need to be concerned at a very significant level, and I don't think you're suggesting we should not be. Um, but in terms of lessons from the past, yes, you move on, and eventually things change. But right now we're in the midst of it, the worst of it, I think. I, I would just comment that um, I, I'm in my 48th year of uh, service, both in the public and private sector. Uh, I cut my teeth in Turkey uh, back in 1972, uh, which was uh, also a period of very heightened uh, threats in Turkey, not so much from the PKK, but from the DH DHKPC. Uh, and we've seen groups come and go over time. Uh, I think uh, the thing that, uh, well, two perspectives. First, the world isn't coming apart because of terrorism. Uh, we are much safer today uh, from the terrorist threat than we've ever been, which is why our <coughs> uh, National Terrorism Advisory System tells Americans the nature of the threat we're facing, which is the homegrown violent extremists and a, uh, an attack out of the blue, but not a, in our view, an Al-Qaeda 9-11 style attack that we have uh, worked very hard to stem that type of uh, attack. What, what worries me uh, in the future is how many young people are being taught hate uh, in failed states across the country. Uh, Tom mentioned going to the Sahel. When I was coordinator for counterterrorism in, in 2001 with the State Department, one of our initiatives was we called it the Sahel Initiative because you could see the roots of potential failed states <clears throat> of uh, this philosophy moving into those areas. And in many ways it has in the course of the last 15 years. So I don't think it's uh, you know, kind of a chicken little you know, sky is falling situation, but if we continue to see failed states, if we continue to see this uh, uh, terrorist philosophy promulgate across those failed states, I think it does create a longer term problem than, uh, uh, than we've had in, in, in the past. Yeah, uh, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, and I think that, that every uh, politician or operational guy working in the field of counterterrorism 
uh, occasionally should ask himself that question. Um, but I think uh, the, the world has changed tremendously. And this is the world of mass communication, global world, uh, the, uh, mass panic maybe even. Um, and the terrorists are, are um, certainly the, the current year, this movement is also operating in a, in a totally different world where uh, xenophobia can combine with religious threats and et cetera, et cetera. So the potential danger of undermining our open democratic society by few is much bigger than it would have been 100 years ago. And, um, and I think um, from, from my respect and also in the work I do, I think it's, it's very important that as a government official um, to always look very careful at the way you communicate. That government should communicate very strategic, very transparent, and very open about the threats, and not create its own fear by uh, the, uh, by reacting. I think that's that's the most important thing we can learn. And at the same time, don't underestimate the danger of the current terrorist threat. The fourth row here, Nikki. The fourth row here, this gentleman. And please uh, identify yourself in your uh, Hi, uh, this is uh, Ali Muhammad, Ali from uh, Afghanistan. I would say I was a former director of counterterrorism and intelligence uh, in the government of Afghanistan. Uh, my question is uh, how, how much progress we have made on uh, policy level uh, with the countries or allies that embraces terrorism within their religious and educational institutions like <clears throat> countries like Pakistan and Saudi Arabia and, and, and this is a direct factor of radicalism and extremism in the West. And we know we just discussed about you know technicalities of counterterrorism. How much progress have we made on policy level to convince our allies not to use those curriculum and methods for radicalizing their society against the West. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy to take a crack at <laughs> since I'm sitting between two sitting government officials <laughs> and I'm not. Um, let, let me just say from all the work that my colleagues and I have done in including hundreds of interviews with government officials from some of the countries you mentioned and many others. Um, depends on the country, of course, but uh, those that are primary source countries of violent extremists, of terrorists in the ideology, not a lot is being done because that ideology, those acting um, with it, who are at the vanguard of the global jihadi movement, are doing the bidding of some folks in those governments you know, for local needs, for regional needs, for global needs and goals that they're trying to attain. There's also the question of whether they can actually control the ideology, control the clerics, the extreme hardline clerics who are putting it out there, whether they control the dog on that leash um, that they've used to harass particular parts of their country, different ethnic groups, um, different neighbors that they have disputes with. And so as long as those melted groups serve as a tool for those governments, which they continue to do, we will not see a significant reduction in, um, in the incidence of radicalization of the ideology uh, of the attacks. And um, it's to the point where we look at many of these countries and we really wonder whether we should call them allies or major non-NATO allies or major uh, or NATO allies themselves. Uh, and here I'm speaking specifically about Turkey, which now is in a different position than it was, but a few years ago, the door was wide open and militants came across their border into Syria. Um, so we have a lot of partners out there who are good partners in some areas, and Turkey is, Pakistan can be, Saudi Arabia as well, very good partners, but in other areas, they're, they're not as good as they could be. And that is, that's my opinion. The only thing I would say uh, to that is um, that in each of the cases, we, we do have partners uh, in Saudi Arabia and Pakistan that are working mutually with us and other parts of the world against um, these threats. But as Tom mentioned, sometimes these forces are hard to 
uh, leash once they've been unleashed. And uh, so the challenge is continuing to work with our partners. I, I've gone to the re-education um, schools in Saudi Arabia. They are very effective uh, from a government uh, the education is probably not the uh, the right term, but uh, demobilization, demobilization, de-radicalization um, places. So I, I think both governments and other governments around the world are trying to work with that problem. But each of those countries has also been the target of terrorist activities. So to Tom's earlier point, I think once you deal uh, with uh, once these forces are. Uh, Within a country, it's very difficult to to control, uh, and that's why working very closely with our partners, we try to help them to to get at uh, solving the problem within their country and how that problem is being manifested uh, elsewhere. Yeah, if if I may add, I mean the, the, the current year this threat is not only to the Western world. Um, they are attacking in Istanbul. They are attacking in Saudi Arabia. They are attacking anywhere. Uh, so everybody is the enemy except their own small group. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, I think we have the, the, the same feeling. I would like to mention the Global Counterterrorist Forum, which the United States uh, co-chaired together with Turkey uh, in the last years, and now uh, the Netherlands are co-chairing with uh, Morocco. Um, and and there are, we are creating excellent partnerships uh, as Western and non-Western countries because the threat is against all of us. Yes, the woman here in the aisle. Hi, my name is Jacqueline Sutherland. I'm with the Chertoff Group. Um, over the past nine months, we've really seen an increase in soft targets being attacked by terrorist actors in Brussels, Paris, Nice, Istanbul. Um, but then similarly, I know that uh, just last week, Interpol came out with a report saying that they're expecting to see uh, many more Paris-style spectacular attacks as more ISIS fighters come back to Europe. So my question is, what do you see really as a more urgent threat at the moment, having many more soft target terrorist attacks um, or sort of these coordinated marauding attacks like Paris? Well, that's, that's a very difficult question because probably both, is, both are true. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the, um, the current situation in Syria and Iraq uh, and the uh, so-called Islamic states getting an even smaller geographic uh, territory probably put a lot of pressure on the current foreign terrorist fighters to return, maybe, to their countries. Uh, they are more violent than ever. They are more radicalized. They are uh, certainly ISIS. Um, and they want to attack, even when they are abroad. And they can connect uh, with the local uh, radical groups. And that can be a very toxic uh, uh, development. Um, that, can, that can lead to either uh, uh, more attacks on soft targets, uh, inspired, as the general said, or organized, directed. I mean, both are possible. Um, and you, you might say everything is possible on the current threat situation. And, it, and certainly on the short term, it's not going to be better. I, I would say you've got to play the entire field. Uh, you can't play off one against the other. I mentioned the aviation threat. That doesn't go away simply because ISIL is attacking in Paris. Uh, that threat continues. And you, you need a multi-tiered effort to, to do it. So <clears throat> you've got to engage the owners and operators of critical infrastructure, as we do in this country every day, to try to uh, get them to better understand the risk landscape and uh, methodologies for protecting uh, commercial facilities, theaters, all the other places that we've seen attacks in. I think you've also uh, have to look at the intelligence piece of this as these foreign fighters return. In many cases, we know who they are, uh, given the amount of intelligence we have and effective law enforcement and intelligence operations to determine what they are up to. Um, continued investigation, the FBI has announced uh, that it, it has investigations in all 50 states, effective investigation uh, with our state and local partners, all contribute to the <coughs> defense, if you will, against these kinds of threats and risks that we face uh, uh, both in Europe uh, and in the homeland. But you can't prevent them all. 
But what you can do, to the extent that you have information and knowledge that you can apply to try to mitigate those risks, that you apply that in a consistent fashion, both from a law enforcement, security, intelligence, and most importantly, from an owner-operator perspective in terms of empowering owner-operators to understand how to mitigate risk in, you know, in an open society. Question coming in from John McGaffin. He's a, an advisor to the TNT program. He's the former Associate Deputy Director of Operations at the CIA. And John asks, will Brexit negatively impact the great improvements made recently in EU counterterrorism efforts? Well, the, the UK was a strong supporter of everything we did. Um, and I'm sure with or without Brexit, they still will be a strong supporter. Uh, but of course, when there are no member states anymore, we have to make other legal arrangements to make sure that everything is still going to work. So it will be more work, but I suppose the intention will be still the same, and uh, we will work around it. Does it complicate things for DHS? It, it, it does not. Uh, we have strong bilateral partnerships with uh, the UK. We think that will continue. Uh, we also think the UK will be a strong partner in Europe, if not in the EU and information sharing and uh, best practices. So um, Brexit will come and go, but uh, we believe uh, uh, our security cooperation will continue to be very strong. Great. Thank you. In the second row here in the black outfit. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Erwan Munajit, the newest addition to the Saudi Embassy. Um, I have a two-part question as well as a comment, if I may. Uh, the first question is, uh, firstly, how effective is the de-radicalization de program, or are the de-radicalization de pro uh, programs um, uh, happening, or how effective have they been in terms in the EU as well as in the United States, um, as well as um, how effective have the, um, I don't know if you do have them, the um, fighting against xenophobia so um, and against anti-Semitism. By anti-Semitism, I mean anti-Arab, anti-Muslim, as well as anti-Jewish um, in, in the uh, tangling the um, complications that all that is creating. Okay. Um, Let's go with the questions because those require responses from both yes. respondents here. So we'll start, Dick, if you can, on the demobilization, deradicalization programs across Europe. We addressed this in the podcast before, <coughs> yeah. before this event. We know there's a variety of programs out there. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in most of our countries, but we, we exchange a lot of information on how to work on it. And I think the, the most important on the de-radicalization program is to, to know who to, re, uh, who to de radicalize or to get, a, uh, uh, to get early signals so you can intervene before they radicalize. And local authorities, at least in the Netherlands, but in most European countries, local authorities play, uh, play a very important role in uh, getting their signals in the right place. Community policing is very important. Uh, uh, the local caseworker is very important, and um, well, I think in the Netherlands we are progressing in uh, getting in, in those communities where radicalization is a real issue, to uh, whether it's, it's jihadist or right wing or whatever, uh, to get it in place and to get those signals and to offer de-radicalization programs if, if necessary. We have an exit program, uh, which was. Uh, we looked a lot to what the Germans did in this, uh, in this regard. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot going on. Um, the results, well, it's difficult to prove that you, were, that you were on the right path, but doing nothing is not an option. Yeah. And in the US? Uh, I, I, I think um, we have been, certainly under Secretary Johnson, very clear that the key for our, uh, countering violent extremism is outreach to communities that are being targeted uh, for this uh, propaganda, and he has been to many, many, many uh, communities across this country. We've revamped our countering violent extremism program uh, to try to empower uh, communities to one understand the threat and the risk, and become voices against this kind of radical uh, ideology. So. 
not so much a de-radicalization, but helping communities to understand what is radicalization, how does it work, and what the tools are. There was uh, the other um, thing you mentioned, and you know, any xenophobia about uh, a, a group of people, a race, a religion uh, is not helpful uh, in the integration process. Um, the wonderful thing about uh, America is uh, we are a country of immigrants. We have learned how to integrate uh, immigrants behind this whole notion of what it is to be an American uh, and things that stand in the way of, uh, of that uh, kind of process uh, doesn't help a community integrate. When communities don't integrate, when communities feel isolated, uh, those ideas that uh, our enemies would try to foment in those communities become easier to, to accept. So um, it's very, very important from an American perspective that we integrate these communities and that these communities be, truly understand that we welcome them to America, that they are part of the American fabric and they are going to be an important part of who we are as a country going forward. Dick, any comments on the second question regarding anti-Semitism, hatred towards Muslims, Jews, Arabs, and others? Well, it's an issue that, that's political uh, that, uh, and, and societal, societal speaking high on the agenda. Um, whether, I mean, the, of course, governments do want to have the integration part right. But in Europe and also in the Netherlands, we have uh, the, uh, seen strong uh, political parties who are, uh, are clearly anti-Islam. Um, and, and we have to deal with those political parties as well. They are part of our life. Let me just offer an anecdote on the demobilization comment. My colleague Jennifer Cook and I are conducting the Africa Sahel Project, and we were in northeast Nigeria in January, in Niger, and Mali. And there is no off-ramp in Nigeria for militants uh, in Boko Haram, many of whom were kidnapped or brought in against their will otherwise uh, into the group. And there is no way for them to to get out of that program and into a demobilization program, and nobody wants them in their backyard at all. And so there are good programs out there. Saudi Arabia's is well regarded, Singapore's is well regarded, uh, Norway's is well regarded. So there are good models out there for demobilization. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully there'll be some information sharing and best practices on that. Next question, uh, someone had their hand up. Yes, in the back, blue shirt. Hi, uh, Sean Carberry, Federal Computer Week. Um, at the center of information sharing is the infrastructure. Uh, you have in the United States a variety of defense and intelligence agencies that are coming to terms with cyber technology and cybersecurity, their own internal networks, how they're connecting, how they're sharing with other federal agencies. Then you add in the same dimension in Europe. Where are things currently in terms of the integration of systems to share data? How much is going to, to cloud with shared access? What are the barriers? And again, how is this affecting the, the sharing of information? And in addition to that, what are the concerns about cyber threats to this information sharing itself? Yeah. Excellent question. Well, let me start with the last one. I mean, the... Uh, um, the, the cyber threat in itself is real, uh, as you probably all know. Uh, and uh, in my office, we also publicize uh, every year uh, the cyber threat assessment. Um, uh, but from the terrorist point of view, I mean, the, the, they are getting more interest in, in cyber. Um, they certainly have interest. Uh, and they have the intention, but they do not yet have the right capabilities uh, to really get to our infrastructure or to get to our information systems. Uh, but maybe the, the, somehow they connect to people who can or in the recent time they can develop those capabilities to, uh, to get to it. So we, we, in the Netherlands and in Europe as well, but certainly in the Netherlands, we put a lot of pressure on, on private and public uh, organizations to have their cybersecurity in place. And I'm not only mentioning about getting XP of your computer, but about real issues of cybersecurity and real vulnerabilities uh, we are looking into. Um, having said so, I think uh, uh, every information exchange, we, we try to, to get it uh, within Europe and also with partners uh, to get it in a more 
operational way that we can very quickly exchange those information, but it has to be all secure. Uh, and uh, that's a, a, a very interesting uh, topic to discuss further, but uh, it takes a lot of time before we really can do so. But we have secure lines, we have secure infrastructure, um, and, and we can rely heavily also on, uh, I'm looking just for my colleague from defense, we can heavily rely on, on what is being developed in defense. Well, the technology is moving, as you know, uh, uh, very quickly, and the security threats continue to, to mount, and so effective cybersecurity in the exchange uh, regimens is going to be critical. Uh, the last thing you want is uh, a back door in one of these systems of information sharing that allows our enemies to, uh, to know what we know. So it's a balancing act. But I, I believe personally that uh, we're moving into an era where um, it used to be, well, I'll tell you when I think you need to know something, into an era between our partners when our partners need to know everything we know and to do so in a secure way so that uh, when they need the information, it's not mother may I, it's there. And we have the same challenge in our own country that when we need the information, when Frank Taylor presents himself at the border, then we need to know whether Frank Taylor's a threat or not. And that, that can't be because we asked our partner, you know, an hour ago, whether Frank Taylor's a threat, we need to know that when it happens. So instantaneous information is what we're trying to build towards doing so with security uh, to protect that information, both the information that's in the system and the way in which that information is being exchanged. It's incredibly important as we build these systems moving forward. Yeah. In the front here. Please keep the questions brief or down to five minutes. Hi, I'm uh, Jack Rapansky, uh, unaffiliated, but a former uh, software developer doing a lot of work in data. Um, my question is, to what extent are you focusing on unstructured and informal data as opposed to the, all the formal stuff where there's like an ID number that you can look up in a database? So like uh, notes on local investigations or rumors or suspicions, you know, where it hasn't raised to the level of you have a confidence in it. I think like the Boston bomber, I mean, they, they had some information, but it wasn't enough. Are you going to be sharing a lot of that, or and how do you deal with that? You're really getting into an area um, that um, is really at the essence of what is information sharing, uh, and what information gets shared, and what the protocols are for sharing that information. And when you really begin, and I'm a techno peasant, so don't get me started talking about technology. Uh, this structured versus unstructured data, tagging data, all of, I leave that to my data science friends to figure out how to do that. But the important thing is the integration of information that we have uh, to build new knowledge. Uh, the, the, the buzzword after 9-11 was connecting the dots. God, we're not only connecting dots anymore, we're connecting uh, needles and haystacks under needles and haystacks and needles and haystacks to try to get, get answers. So the challenge is uh, moving data, protecting civil rights, civil liberties, not making false allegations and trying to do all that in real time. If you got an idea, let us know and we'll, we'll try to implement it. It, 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 it is a daunting, <coughs> challenge. But I would tell you that the U.S. government and our partners across the globe have taken on that challenge in ways that we never thought we could do. One, in protecting the information, protecting civil rights, civil liberties, and also sharing that information in near real time, uh, much better than 15 years ago after 9-11. Hi, Amira Kamakum with Sayari Analytics. So we've talked a lot about the political, security, social aspects of countering terrorism, but um, nobody on the panel has spoken about uh, terrorist financing, which is also a huge uh, fuel to the fire, along with propaganda, you know, the political and social um, and security side of it. So I'm just wondering, on both sides of the spectrum, whether it be in the EU, from the United States, uh, what are we doing in both governments to stop terrorist financing? Um, how does Intel play into that? And then what are the actions taken afterwards? 
Well, good question again. Um, I, I, I think it's one of the most uh, difficult topics we are uh, trying to uh, get a grip on. Um, judicial, political, uh, practical. Um, and I think um, we, we, uh, we have seen an, an, a big increase in, in the freezing of assets of uh, persons in the Netherlands. Uh, but it's, it's all very compli complicated cases uh, which we have to, um, uh, to, before the decision is being made, there has to be a lot of proof that an individual did actually uh, somehow contributed to uh, uh, finance, of finance terrorism. The same is true when it's regarded uh, the uh, institutions, uh, for example, in the Netherlands. Um, if a, if a, uh, an organization is not listed, you cannot do things. <coughs> Uh, and I think listing is a very difficult process in itself. And we have seen uh, the, uh, on different occasions now that one part of the organization is listed within the UN, but another part is not listed. And if, a, if an organization is listed, they change to another organization. And before you get to the process of, of listing, you're probably already uh, too late again. So, uh, and then and there is, of course, the, the issue also legally. Uh, um, if, and how do you want to argue that, for example, foreign finance from mosque in the Netherlands, you cannot just simply say, we don't want to have foreign finance of mosque in the Netherlands. Because we have seen before that other churches are being financed from abroad as well. So there are a lot of questions involved. And it's, it's a very important question, by the way, because uh, the small amounts of money and big amounts of money can play a, a very, um, what they, they can, uh, play an important role in the, in, the, um, in the development of terrorism. But I think the, um, the answer still has to be found, and, and I, I suppose that the United Nations listing and the US <coughs> or United States listing plays a very important role in it. And how can we do, get, have to prove, and how can we really act very quickly to get the listings right? Because we didn't speak to it doesn't mean it's not ongoing. There's a very significant uh, investment in our Treasury <coughs> Department uh, looking at this whole issue of foreign terrorists uh, uh, financing the F8, uh, foreign uh, FATF um, has been working on this since I was in State Department 15 years ago. So that, that effort on go is ongoing. It's complicated. Uh, investigatively, we are building better tools to help us better understand that phenomenon and indeed coming out of uh, Paris and Brussels, uh, working with our Europe, uh, European partners, we were able to kind of uncover some of the connections uh, using uh, financial tools. Uh, so it's, it's a part of the fight. It's not one that uh, uh, we have forgotten about, but it's a, an important tool in dismantling these organizations across the globe. I think we have come to the uh, close of our event. I know we have many more questions here and love to have you answer all of them, but both of these gentlemen have very busy schedules, so we will have to close it out, I'm sorry to say, but I am very happy that uh, we had such a great turnout for two superb experts on this topic of information sharing, intelligence sharing, threats facing both of our countries and the globe at large. And thank you very much for the hard work you've done and your nation's done when you held the presidency of the EU and for the roadmap that you presented today. And General Taylor, for everything you and your team has done for, in protecting not only the United States, but our partners around the world. And a big round of applause for that. Thank you. Thank Thanks, Frank. Yeah, dynamite.